Broadcasting live to Bill's Mafia Worldwide with Greg Thompson and Aaron Quinn. Welcome to the NFL. Doesn't matter what's happened before today. Today's a brand new day. It's a brand new season. Your number one podcast for objective Buffalo Bills coverage. No matter where you are, we got you covered. Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your host, Greg Thompson, along with my partner in crime, Aaron. How are we doing? I'm doing fantastic, man. I was uh, I got this new background made up for us. It's a little bit brighter. I, like I don't know. I don't know if I will keep it, but for today, we're keeping it. I was feeling it today, so we switched things up. Uh, that's what you got to do in the offseason. Keep, stay interested. In got to keep things man. fresh. Got to yeah, keep things right. fresh. Speaking of which, it was kind of difficult. Like, it's interesting that we signed, like, eight more people and it it was like man all right <laughs> just that after the first week of free agency it's really hard to keep that high of, of where things were but it's crazy that Bean just kept adding people and adding people yesterday and today were the first calendar days he went the entire time the first seven straight days he added more and more people every single day it was really crazy to see you know just I none of us expected that much yeah no I think here's the thing every single pre-free agency greg we get on here what was it two years ago we were like there's no way they're gonna be able to fix the entire offensive line in a single off season uh last year it was there's no way we're getting daryl williams and matt milano back the money just isn't there we're gonna have to pick one remember all those twitter posts like you can only have one pick one he doesn't he goes out and gets it this year it was we're not getting any splash free agents we're not gonna get that many guys like it's gonna be real tight boom like it's almost like Josh Allen. Every time they say he can't do something, he can't play Seriously. in the cold. Like it, Brandon Bean's got the same thing. He's on Twitter. He sees us saying, oh, he can't get that. <laughs> he can't do this. And Brandon Bean's like, bam, slapping it down on us. So um, it, it's a tough mix for it, – it, it's a little bit of a tough mix for you, but then there's examples proving you that the salary cap is not mm. – it, it's not a myth, but it's – it's interesting what they're able to do. I think even Brandon Bean surprised you with what they were able to oh, do. Yeah. But then the salary cap is true because look what happened in Kansas City today. Well, Kansas City and Green Bay, you know, so I, I we went through and when we did our salary cap spectacular, we went through all the things they could do. But we prefaced right. it by saying he's not going to do all these things. He's not going to flip all these switches or, or or do all these different movements. And honestly, he hasn't. Like the What he's done was probably more releases than we anticipated. I think both of us thought that guys like Cole Beasley or Daryl Williams were more likely staying on a pay cut. So those two releases freed up a big chunk of money. Right. What we didn't anticipate was when he added people, we had never seen him leverage this many void years and this many other tricks to be able to decrease the the cap hits. And, you know, as we kind of get into some of the, the recap for last week, what you saw in Kansas City and Green Bay was the reality of that, you know, uh, the cap is real where you can't pay, you know, that much money to that many different guys. And we saw Tyree kill and Devontae Adams both traded away when they're elite players. And that um, Amari Cooper traded away from the Cowboys and the Cowboys lost Amari Cooper and Randy Gregory. And that, you know, the saints lost Taron Armstead and Marcus Williams, you know, the, the cap is real, even if it is flexible. Right. Yeah, so, no, it, I'd love to be in that position in a few oh, years. I, yeah. I think that the beans done a good enough job to, you know, we're, they'll be one of those teams here yeah. in the next three to four years. They're going to be competitive. They'll be right in line. They'll still be able to field a good football team, but they're going to have to play some of these games where, you know, you're trading away a, a player that everybody loves in order to get some picks to try to replace yeah. that because it, you're just too tight up against the cap, but they're not there yet. Yeah, I will say some of this in what we did and, and, you know, some of the things we knew the names last week. So obviously we knew that Daquan Jones and Tim Settle and Roger Saffold were those first free agents. We knew the night of the show, right. that Von Miller and OJ Howard were coming aboard. We knew about all five of those ads. What we didn't know was How? that he was going to start with multiple void years, uh, delayed uh, option bonuses for Von Miller, all the different pieces of what they were doing that it's kind of like opening Pandora's box. Like once you open it, like now 
we're going to be one of those teams. It doesn't mean that every year we're going to have to leverage the you know crazy different things over and over again, but we're going to have to restructure some here. things each year to keep making room. And that I know, um, you know, Jason here talking about the cap, you know, may go up this year. It's two oh uh, two oh nine point six or whatever it is. I've seen projections that next year could go to two twenty five. Yeah. Um, I think two twenty five to two thirty is absolutely in play. I've seen that that could jump up to two fifty or two fifty five or two sixty the following year. I think that's what Brandon Bean is banking on. That we're going to see big jumps of twenty five and thirty million versus the former ten million, and that hey, we're going to be okay when we get to those years to be able to pull those things in, and it's going to allow them to do that and that's why you saw you know daquan jones was a two-year deal but he added a third void year tim settle was a two-year deal with a third year void year when they restructured micah hyde they added three void years onto yeah. the end of that to spread it out matt milano two void years we had just never seen them structure contracts like that yeah i mean it's a good sign though that you want they built this process methodically, right? They yeah. they've gone through, but even through that time, Brandon Bean got aggressive. That trade for Kelvin Benjamin was still aggressive. It didn't work out, but that was yeah. an aggressive trade yeah. at the time and a team that was rebuilding. You thought maybe he had some magic. So he's shown in the past if he thinks he has a chance to do something, he's willing to go and get aggressive to do that. And I've been saying that your windows open with Josh Allen as long as he's here, but that window is going to fluctuate over time. Yeah. Right now the window's wide open and you've got to strike when you have the opportunity with a window wide open after these few years, after this Von Miller thing catches up, the window shuts a little bit. It won't be yeah. fully closed, but it'll be a We've little bit shut. Aaron Rodgers had down yeah. years with the Packers. Absolutely. Tom Brady had a down year with the Patriots the year before he left. Russell Wilson had down. You're like, you can be excellent and still have down years. But when the window's to- open being aggressive, is how you take that next step, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and there's a couple of things, a question here about um, what do you guys think about Stefan Diggs' contract? I had a lot of questions on this on Twitter, and I got to tell you guys, everybody being frustrated, oh my gosh, why didn't Bean you know, lock him up beforehand? He didn't because Stefan Diggs' agent knew yeah. that you know Tyreek Hill was due a contract and that Devontae Adams was a free agent. They, they didn't want to. They wanted to wait for this to happen, to set the market and say, hey, look how much these other guys are paying. I don't know that he anticipated Christian Kirk getting $84 million from the Jaguars. Jaguars market, knew. yeah, Jaguars market cannot be reflected yeah, upon correct. the rest that, of the NFL. That's not a comp yeah. to, to be able to, to, to bring into play. <laughs> um, but they knew that was coming. So um, And so did Brandon Bean. That's yeah. why there wasn't any big push for it. They're going to take care of him. They're going to talk about it. And if the number's crazy, they'll wait. He's under contract for two more years. Correct. They yeah. could do something this summer. They could do something next spring. And, they and it would be completely fine. Franchise tag him. I don't think yeah. we'll ever get to that with Brandon Bean, but there's – plenty of insurance to keep him here correct. while the window's wide open. Correct. Correct. So, and um, if what we believe from Brandon Bean is true too, that he's saying Josh Allen's involved in these decisions, especially on the offensive side of the ball, Stefan, Stefan Dix isn't going anywhere guys. He's correct. going to Josh Allen's best friends, both on and off the field. Like he's a huge factor. If, if there's anyone on this team that Josh Allen is pounding the table for, it's going to be Stefan Dix. Whatever's driving you nuts over there. It's oh getting to me. What is it? It's killing me. There's a hair hanging down in my face and oh. it's making me crazy. These and are problems I don't have. Yeah. I, I don't know what's don't happening, with. but it's yeah. going to literally drive me crazy. I don't know where it's coming That's from. Fantastic. I can just see it right I'm here. I'm so excited that you're annoyed all night. It's literally going to make me absolutely <laughs> I insane. It I, you all I night can't long. see it and it's, it's going to drive me nuts. I don't know what's going yeah. on. This is um, I'm going to have an aneurysm. Um, yeah. So obviously with the moves from last week, um, we knew a lot of that coming into last week's show. So obviously we talked about those guys we rattled off, you know, between Settle and Saffold to Daquan Jones, Von Miller and OJ Howard. That's where we kind of kept things off. So we want to start right there coming into this week's show of what the next moves are that we want to be able to talk about. So um, the first one that we saw was something that, you know, we heard from some other people being reported that the writing was on the wall and that it was a matter of whether it was a release or whether it was, um, you know, a trade that Cole Beasley was not going to be back. And then we saw it happen. Um, he didn't wait all the way up until the Sunday deadline of when his roster bonus was due. Um, I think that they called around enough to realize the trade market simply wasn't there. We saw, you know, other ugly contracts you know amari cooper went for a sixth round pick if amari yeah. cooper is going for a sixth round pick we're probably not getting something back for cole beasley right um 
So it, it's something that's in play. Honestly, I think the Giants are lying to themselves about James Bradbury, and I think we might see the same thing there that, hey, nobody's going to trade for that. You're going to have to release him. Um, did it surprise you when it, when he got released? No, I think John Scott, I trusted what he was saying yeah. uh, earlier in the week, and he said it wasn't an opinion that he had source information that this was either going to, that was how this was going to resolve itself, either through trade, uh, which the team preferred, or through release. And once I saw what the team preferred, it felt like somebody was letting that information get out, knowing that it wasn't probably going to be the case and then he was going to end up being released here so not surprising um and I we think- do see some of those where they plant that seed to see if there's any last yeah. minute trade uh offer but sure yeah i mean brandon bean said it himself this last week that they check into those rumors if they hear rumblings that a player is available or, or something's going on they do their due diligence checks i would assume other GMs do as well. But yeah, um, you weren't going to get a bunch of trade interest in a guy that is probably going to get released anyway. The age that he's at, the idea that he's a declining asset, whether or not it's true or not, teams are going to play that against you right. in, in negotiation. So not surprised that it ended up being a release. Um, I do think I was happy with the way Bills fans responded to that. Yeah. After the last, it's been a contentious year. With him and Twitter. And a lot of things, a lot been. of appreciation, some cool videos. Yeah, I saw a lot of appreciation posts, and I'm glad to see that because he meant a lot to the trajectory of this team and the, the how Josh Allen was able to take those steps. When it was hit, Beasley and John Brown arrived, that, that was a different uh, chapter in Josh Allen's progress and where this team was going. He was a big part of that here for the last three years. So I got nothing but love for what he did on the field here. Uh, so, sad to see it end in his release. I think he could have been helpful here to the 2022 bills but you know what the, the we'll talk about here in a little bit the other moves they did made me feel a little bit better about cole beasley not being yeah. a part of this team um we got a question on and i think it's a good topic to be able to bring up here is i i think james bradbury is an interesting name in that i know everyone is anxious that we haven't done anything on the market we haven't brought in a second corner um we don't have any competition there some of those names are whittling away technically stefan gilmore still out there bryce callahan still out there uh i think it's going to be more in the steven nelson joe hayden patrick peterson range um which you definitely need to, i want a premium draft pick plus any of those guys but you sure. need it with them the one guy define that premium would, though are we talking third uh, round first, can taylor Bray? day one day no. two day okay. one day two if it's a day two pick, that's still a premium. Okay. Pick. Top okay. hundred picks to me are premium picks. Okay. All right. Um, the one guy, not that he changes the need for it, but the one guy who legitimately would shift my anxiety and I could live with him and Dane Jackson is is James Bradbury. He's yeah. the one guy that if he gets released or we trade for him with an extension restructure that his cap number right now that for anybody that is like sure it's thirteen million dollars. Yeah. The reason and it's why no one's going to trade for him. You like can't he's, take it. He's good. He's I don't know that he's still they, thirteen million dollars good. Yeah, um, they took a bonus. Then they they had to pay him like a few million dollar bonus. They paid a little bit and a lot that might make him more tradable. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but it's still the team is taking the salary is still thirteen million dollars. I think it's yeah. thirteen point four if I recall right. Um, he's the one guy that if he gets released, obviously for anybody who's not familiar, Brandon Bean drafted him. Yep. And Sean McDermott used him as his mm-hmm. starting corner to replace Josh Norman when he was the the defensive coordinator in Carolina. Um, they are very familiar with him as a player. Um, he was a second round pick by Brandon Bean. He was a premium asset to be able to bring him in. They're very familiar with him. If he gets released, not that it means I don't want corner anymore, but he's the one guy that to me turns us back into best player available yeah. and that I could live with a guard in the first round. I could live with a wide receiver in the first round. I could live with wide receiver guard in the first two rounds or wide receiver running back and guard in the third round and a developmental corner in the fourth round. If we add James Bradbury, it opens options for me that I don't think – just about any, I don't think Stefan Gilmore's coming back and he's old anyways, but I don't know that there's any free agent that does that mindset change to me. Yeah, I've been pounding the table for Bradbury since I was looking into who are trade possible candidates when you look at contract, where things are going, are they likely to be back with that team? He was a guy that checked all those boxes, uh, just like a Roger Saffold before yeah. he was released, checked all those boxes yeah. for, hey, this is a guy you would bring on to the Bills, familiarity with the coaching staff. Bradbury checks all these boxes for me. Uh, he's a player I like as well, so it makes it a, a smooth transition. I think he 
if he's going to reclaim any part of his career and the success he's had, I think it's with a guy like Sean McDermott that can put him in a place to age gracefully into a good cornerback. I think the scheme allows for DBs to age a little bit gracefully. So I'd be all for it. And then you get him and Trey back at some point midway through this season. Uh, we don't know when Trey's coming back, but that that is the improvement that we were seeking yeah. when we uh, were talking about replacing Levi Wallace. My issue right now is they haven't maintained the floor of Levi Correct. Wallace leaving Correct. and they allowed him to leave for almost nothing. So I'm a little yeah, frustrated. That they, it yeah. tells me, I, I don't, I don't want to presume that it means they know they can get Bradbury, but it makes me think they have a plan and I don't know what the plan is. And I don't like it that we haven't seen it yet. I don't think they let Levi Wallace walk and just like, well, I'll figure it out. Like it's, they're not those kind of guys. But I just I wish I knew what the plan was. Yeah. And there's very few right now options that to me get me back to the floor. I think you get yeah. close, can get close to the floor. I, I think, don't think you're gonna Callahan's get... the only guy that I Callahan. think is better than Wallace. Yeah, sure. Everybody else is Wallace or worse. Yeah, yeah. Or Bradbury. And, Correct. and so Bradbury is obviously number one. Yeah. Yeah. If you have so if he comes free and again, I think there's money for him out in the market. I don't think anyone wants to pay him what he's getting. Well, and that's this year, but there's some here. money out here in the market for him. Yeah, there's a couple of questions here. Jason Noek asking, where is Buffalo on the cap as we speak? It's literally zero. Yeah. Like it, it's no money. So even to do to match a Ryan Bates offer to uh add our draft picks to make any other move, they have to do more restructures. But as Ron asks here about time to clip another coupon, they actually only did two restructures. They only right. restructured Milano and Micah Hyde so they can restructure Jordan Poyer. They can restructure Trey White. They can restructure Deion Dawkins. They can restructure Josh Allen. Technically, they could restructure Stephon Diggs, but you're not going to go to him with that when you know he wants an extension. Um, so they have plenty of options to do that, but they would have to. They Right now, I, I think over the cap shows them like, twenty thousand dollars over the cap because like uh, they don't have all the details on everything but they are literally right up against it right now yeah. so um anything else that happens and i think james bradbury's market is somewhere between six and ten million dollars like i think he's as good as the uh, some of the guys who got 10 million it's late in the market right now for some of those spots already taken so i think you could give him a deal that is Six million up front, but maybe ten million in cash with some of the other things that got kicked down the line with some of the void years or like a two year, you know, deal like that that kicks some of the money into future years. But he's not a super cheap guy. He, you know, he deserved to get signed to a near Trey White level deal when he got that, and this is the last year of that deal at thirteen million and change. Um, but he was an elite player. I think he had mm -hmm. an All Pro season. Yeah, yeah, no, he is an elite player. And if you can get him even close back to that, um, this might be a scenario where he does take a little bit less because yeah. it's a late market and you latch on with a winner. And man, if he can even show a little bit of the player that he was, he could go on to get a nice contract somewhere else while you develop a guy. Um, yeah. But yeah, so even with Bradbury, I'm still team draft a corner, but I think sure. it relieves some of that that you're really. Now, it could yet. just be Cam Taylor Britt in the third round. Sure, it right. doesn't need to be a first yeah, round some and fourth, a third fifth round. round. Yeah. Yeah. Developmental guy. Yep. So after the Cole Beasley release, one of the next moves we saw was the return home. We we saw we heard some whispers of it uh, the night of last Wednesday night, but then we saw the official ad of Jordan Phillips and Shaq Lawson both returning. Um, Jordan Phillips got a little bit more money than I thought. I thought he was. I thought both of them were going to be minimum deals. Jordan Phillips ended up getting like three and a half million. Um, Shaq Lawson is a minimum deal. So, you know, he got the same as some of the other guys we're going to talk about later on in the show. But I think as a fourth defensive tackle and as a fifth defensive end, these are great ads. You know, we, we, when they were free agents, we were both very out in front of the fact that, hey, these are not 10 million a year guys. These are not three year, $36 million guys. That's crazy money. I don't know what the Cardinals and the Dolphins are doing. Yeah. I like them both. They're good players, but they're just not that level of player. You know, obviously not, we miss plenty, but we were dead on on both of those. They were not that level of player, but it doesn't mean they're trash. Like they're still good NFL mm -hmm. players. And to have that caliber of player coming back for super cheap as a fourth defensive tackle and as a fifth defensive end, this now Shaq Lawson is just going to push Boogie Basham sure. to be make sure that they're up to speed. Push AJ Epinesa. Um, I like that as a rotational depth guy. This is who they were all along, right? This has been the problem. Like, yeah, uh, it's almost a Patriot esque move of the Patriot dynasty years where you would have a player in your system and they wanted to get that money and you weren't going to give it to them. So you let them go get it. 
wash around the NFL for a year or two and then come back and play at the deal that they should be playing at in the role that they should be. Uh, this is smart football. It's smart business. Uh, and it worked out for both sides because those players both wanted to come back, you know, regardless of what people want to say about Sean McDermott and the work environment that he creates. Many people decided to come back the Buffalo Bills here in this free agency, which is weird. They must be masochists like the rest of us. Yeah, uh, just obviously. You know, obviously, Sean McDermott has such yeah. a toxic environment yeah. that these guys can't wait to come back and stick it to them and, and yeah. show them. Man. But yeah, I think it, it, it is amazing to see how excited those guys are to come home. I think I got labeled a little bit of a Jordan Phillips hater because people would bring him up uh, when he went into free agency as like this is the kind of game wrecking defensive tackle that we need when I mean, he needs more you know he's almost the level of isaiah mckenzie truthers like this guy's the pr- going to be a premier defensive tackle for us and that wasn't the case i think he is who the bills just re-signed him to be which is yeah. uh, above average rotational interior defensive lineman that can get yeah. some pressure on a quarterback and sort of same thing with Shaq. like he's probably above average rotational good run kid, defender good strong run defender, edge can keep contained things like that like the, honestly this is exactly what you want we don't have another guy like Greg Rousseau who sure. can set the edge and play run defense. It's yeah. nice to have two of those. Mm-hmm. I, it's nice that if we're in like a, hey, they're trying to run the ball situation, it's kind of nice to put the two of them up there as the two defensive ends. I like that. And he can kick inside and rotate at three tech yeah. on pass rushdowns. That's great. And for him to play 20 snaps a game, I'd love it. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah. No, so uh, good all around. Yeah, nice and easy ones. So some of the next moves that we saw was on the backup quarterback front. Um, so obviously we talked a lot about wanting to stay, you know, relatively cheap. But we, hey, who wants to come take our two or three million dollar deal? Um, they they took an interesting path. I got into some arguments with people on Twitter about some people being very anxious about wasting the two hundred and forty eighth pick in the draft, a, a late seventh round. People really like Smoke Monday. Man, it, well, the, obviously, that, that, that was his spot. They, they, <laughs> yeah. we, they traded his spot. So what the Bills eventually did was um, Case Keenum was probably going to get cut by the Cleveland Browns. But they, you know, I trust that Brandon Bean poked around the quarterback market. We saw Jacoby Brissett sign for four and a half or five million. Crazy. Uh, you know, I thought he was going to be the, the missing fallback cheap musical guy. chair. Yeah. You know, obviously Trubisky got, you know, uh, up to $27 million, $14 million. We saw, you know, pretty good money for Tyrod Taylor. Colt McCoy got more money than what we're paying Case Keenum. We're paying the same as Joe Flacco uh, for this deal. Is there Um, a better world than backup QB? It it is amazing. The names that I'm You can underachieve. Millions be totally dollars. underachieved and make millions. Yes. So we we uh Case Keenum was due seven point one million dollars. The Browns paid a one million dollar roster bonus, so he had six point yeah. one million left. We knew the Bills weren't taking that on, but we didn't know what the number was at the time of the trade. Right. So they asked the Browns, "Hey, if we give you a seventh round pick, will you give us exclusive negotiating rights to work out a restructure or pay cut for him, and he can't sign with any other team, and then we get him directly?" That's basically what they did is they spent yeah, a seventh a round claim. pick for yeah. an exclusive negotiating window where nobody else could snipe us um and yes could they have rolled the dice to say nope you got to release him and that hope nobody else paid him more than that but you know i just rattle off some names Get the guy you want colt yeah. mccoy jacoby Brissett. he's better than those guys he's a tyrod taylor level player that we've seen has i mean been, right he, like we you know, know that been, he can do it yeah we, anybody who didn't watch the you know minneapolis miracle and you know that was an 11 and 3 season going to the playoffs and you know won a playoff game with stefan diggs like he's had high caliber play you know, a lot of people last year with Cleveland listed him as a top five backup in the league. He he went in exactly what you, we want. He came in for two games for Cleveland for Baker Mayfield. They went 2-0. That's right. what you want. You want to have a high-end backup. So we got that, but we got it at $3.5 million. We got it for the same as Joe Flacco. We got it for less than Colt McCoy. We got it for less than Jacoby Brissett. I don't care that we paid a seventh round pick to do that. People you know, were talking about taking a late round quarterback to fill that oh, role oh, uh, with a draft. No, and that's you. so much worse. No, thank you. Yeah, the the so. Jake Fromm. I don't want a Jake Fromm. I don't want that. Yeah, no, I want a case Keenum. Uh, this is a, for me, I was excited. I was out all day when this one came up, but I saw yeah. some of the takes of people getting frustrated that Barkley was back and like giving up a pick for this. And I was excited. I was on the opposite end. I said, as soon as I saw it, I said that that's a move that makes sense. Uh, exact, you're exactly right. I think they poked around what was going to be of how this yeah. rest of this QB market was going to shake out. And I think you and I were probably a little bit, um, say, biased towards what we sure. wanted, how sure. how we wanted it to shake out. And what the reality is, is uh, if you want the guy, 
he's not going to be available at the price he wants. So you're going to have to go get him some other way. Well, it's all assets, right? Like correct. you're either paying cash money or you're like paying assets to get that negotiating window for yourself so you can get a deal that makes sense. Well, and obviously we saw the one thing I didn't take into account with last year versus this year was I didn't factor in the fact that the cap went down last year. Mm -hmm. So why do you think we're seeing the, you know, Christian Kirk deals for this year? Why do you think we're seeing some of these crazy, you know, payments? Again, we can't, no, we can't Jacksonville. I can't bring that up. <laughs> Why do you think we're seeing some of these monster contracts? It's yeah. because the cap finally went back up a, a sizable amount. So it makes sense that that floor rose. There wasn't going to be a Mitch Trubisky for two and a half million. I, you know, Marcus Mariota is the exact same example. Underachieving top three pick who is looking for kind of a home but doesn't really deserve their own spot altogether. You know, he got $12 million from the Atlanta Falcons. You know, so right. that, that wasn't going to happen. We weren't going to get that $2.5 million Trubisky. And that I think, you know, we and many other fans set that as a precedent or a bar saying, well, someone has to take this. Well, it's, that's not how it works. Nobody yeah. has to take right. that. You know, they can, you know, put it out there. So getting Case Keenum, who I think is in that same tier of, you know, the, those kind of guys is – if for three and a half million is a win. I'm perfectly good with it. I think it's fine. Matt Barkley, I think, honest to God, I think was Josh Allen saying, hey, don't go claim Jake Fromm. I like Matt. Let him come back and be in the QB3. And he can this is a training game. Like, I want to hang out with summer. I yeah. like Matt. He's a really good locker room ad. Yeah. And then, you know, pay him a little bit of a signing bonus. So when we cut him at cut down day, he already made a little bit of money so he can stay as the third quarterback when yeah. it comes into practice squad. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, Josh Allen's excited to go back to uh, St. John Fisher and yeah. do a camp, and he wants Matt yeah. Barkley. Watch there. Barkley's roommate. Yeah. That that was it. Yeah, yeah. He, he can caddy for me this summer. <laughs> It'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You know what? This has been a ongoing theme for us since Josh Allen got here, and we knew that Brandon Bean was going to go all in around him. All I want is for Josh Allen to be happy. Yeah. That's really. Yeah, I want a comfortable yeah. work environment where everything surrounds him, where everything's about him. He has. Uh, his hands in on decisions, the things he wants. He's earned all that for me. Yeah. You've got one of the top five quarterbacks in the league. Give the man yeah. whatever he wants. Yeah. And I'll tell you, my wife said the same thing. She's like, Oh, you guys got Case Keenum? He was better than Pat Baker Mayfield. Yeah. Last right. Year. Um, and I will say one other legitimate ad for him we do have a very young quarterback room. So Josh doesn't sure. need the mentorship, but, you know, Ken Dorsey's never called plays. Joe Brady is younger than Case Keenum. You know, right. it's why they hired Mike Shula. I think having a guy who is still the NCAA all-time leader in touchdowns, completions, and yards, has led playoff wins, has won 29 games in the NFL, that's and not nothing. Having that voice in the room with those other guys to decipher coverages and to help with defensive game planning and to be able to set themselves up, there's value in that as well. Yeah, and he could be around for a few years. Well, he's only 34. 34. Three yeah. years. 34, and 35. The way QBs 36, are good. playing and backup QBs can run into, he, he could go another four or five years oh, yeah. uh, playing at, at above average backup level. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I don't know that he's a Nick Foles that we're going to ride to a championship, but that's I think probably he's close. That's probably he's close to problem. where he is as a backup. If we if we lost Josh for a four game stretch, I would expect three and one. I would expect him sure. to be able to go and win games. He can win you games. He can keep a team together. I Correct. think uh, in terms of leadership, I, I, he's a guy you can win games with. He's yeah, not right. going to come out and win a bunch of games for yeah. you. But the Bills have the talent where if a quarterback can just make it so the wheels don't fall off, that's all you yeah. you really are trying to hang in a game. Then that's all you need. So some of the next moves were just you know regular depth moves. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but obviously Markel Lee at linebacker, Greg Mance at offensive line. Um, you know, obviously these are the same things that happen every time these kind of ads come up, you know, it's always something where it's, Oh, does this mean we're moving Tremaine Edmonds? Oh, does yeah. this mean that we're not re-signing, uh, Rick Bates is that he's leaving on the, on his tender? No, it just means that you needed somebody to compete with Terrell Dotson for yeah. the AJ Klein spot. It means that, hey, we lost Feliciano and Ike Bakker, and we'll see on, on Rick Bates and Darrell Williams. We need some veteran interior defense, offensive linemen. Greg Mance can play center and guard. Uh, these, these are just depth ads. They're both veteran minimum ads. Neither of them are guaranteed to make no. the roster. Or, yeah. I, I don't even know if I'd say likely. I think both of them have a legit shot. To, to make the roster probably Mance more than Lee, um, but not anything crazy. 
No, nothing crazy. I think Marco Lee could be a pretty above average special teams player. I think if he caught on and was able to get those snaps, yeah. I think that did well in that role with Vegas. Yeah. Maybe you're competing with Andre Smith or Manikevich in, in that one role uh, for special teams. I think he could be above average if they decided to go that route. Um, Mansk is you need a basically below average swing interior offensive lineman. I know that sucks, but that's sort of how the NFL is when you're talking about your backup situation. Uh, a lot of teams don't even have start. That's their starters are below yeah. average journeyman linemen. I, I don't hope that's not going to be the case this year, but I think at, yeah. a, at minimum, he's going to be your guy. That's a swing interior guy. That's yeah. probably on the active 53, just because of that versatility, unless they do something here in the draft and get some versatility that way. I think this is the insurance for that. Yeah. If Ike Bakker didn't tear his Achilles, he's would have been Ike Bakker. He's right, the right. Ike Bakker. Yeah. Like that, that's what he is. He's yeah. that guy. Um, so one better than Bobby ones- Hart, right? Like yeah, better than carrying a Bobby Hart on our better head. than Bobby Hart. We had a boy. Um, so one of the next ones that came up, I think, is kind of interesting, and that's Duke yeah. Johnson. Um, this is one where you know, I you know, obviously we had the response that we did, and we saw Brandon Bean's response with the whole situation with JD McKissick, and that obviously Washington was shady. For anybody who didn't hear, um, he was very quick to defend. Duke or uh, JD McKissick's agent. Correct. So what the story and what I read and the couple of different reports that were out there, JD McKissick agreed to the deal with Buffalo. Um, the agent told Washington, they said, Hey, congratulations. We're happy for you. We wish you all the best. Then later on, hours later, numbers came out of what the contract was. And obviously it was a value, just like a lot of the other signings that, that Brandon Bean made. And all of a sudden, Washington, not Ron Rivera, who has a relationship with Bean, but the GM, all of a sudden started reaching out directly to McKissick and telling them that, hey, your agent didn't give us a chance to, to talk numbers. Um, we didn't We didn't know that's what you were looking for. We'd love to have you back at that number. And that there's no formal rule that says you can't do that because he had not formally signed the contract, but it is very much an unwritten rule that that's just shady business. You can't go after you see the number somebody else agreed to and say, Oh, well, we didn't know you were going to do it for that. We would have done that. Right. Part of it to me, it's tough. Uh, I, I understand why he's not getting on the agents in this scenario and that they were professional. I'm still frustrated with the player at the end of the day that he had an agreement with a team and he decided he makes that decision. The yes, correct. commanders did not force him to do that, even though their work was sketchy. So I think everyone should be mad at the commanders for what they do. And Brandon Bean has the right to be mad, but I think that's a little stinks of McKissick too. As yeah. I've tweeted jokingly, he's dead to me, but a little bit, it's like, okay, well you don't want to be here, man. Then I'm sorry. And that yeah. was my guy. That was like, you chose Carson guy. Wentz over Josh Allen. Yeah, what you're is crazy. wrong with you? Yeah, I mean, um, people have personal things, so I can't speak to his personal. He reasons. lives there. He, yeah, he lives yeah. there. He doesn't want knows what his family situation. But still, I'm mad as a fan, so I don't want. To yeah, talk to let's talk about Duke Johnson. So now, it, you know, and I said I, I'll be fair, just like you, I preferred JD McKissick. But as I started sure. to dive into this and look at the numbers, look at the efficiency, you know, yards per target, yards per route run, yards per reception, Duke Johnson was actually better than McKissick Mm -hmm. in all those different areas. And that Duke Johnson also was a little better running the ball. Um, The more recent success, I think, filtered a lot of people. They're also within just a couple weeks age of each other. They both had birthdays in the same year, but in August and September, they're the exact same age. I don't think there's a ton more wear and tear on it because McKissick actually had more usage recently. I think Duke Johnson's a very nice ad. I think they're in the same tier. Um, I don't think it's a big downgrade. Again, I would have preferred McKissick, but I don't think this is a downgrade. I think this is the kind of guy that we've been talking about for a while that they wanted this type of player. Um, I think fans are going to like Duke Johnson when we see him get in here. Yeah, I really like this a lot. This is another one that I wasn't around for as soon as it happened, so I got uh, the news a little bit late. Duke Johnson's a guy probably the last three years that I've been trying to find ways. Anytime he's gotten cut, trying to find ways to get him on this roster, I think he fits exactly the type of need. I think going into free agency, maybe I fell victim to – it's really weird now. Some free agents you just assume – because like their name or you hear their name or they float around team so often that they're much older than they are, that they yeah. maybe it's worn off. But there was, I had an assumption of McKissick being a sexy, newer, flashier thing. And Duke Johnson being like, oh, I wanted that three years ago, but no one's really been able to get it out of him. 
So maybe I'll go with the new thing. But really, I agree with you that I think they are closer to that same tier. And especially uh, and, McKissick at three and a half million or Duke Johnson for yeah, sure. one million. Now yeah. I feel way better about it. Absolutely. I think you can get the same level of production. It's not as sexy of a name. Nobody's been able to figure out the Duke Johnson. Like he's put up productive. He had that 1000 yard season in Cleveland. Yeah. But even, I mean, he only was in what, five games last year and he had 71 rushes, 330 yards, 4.6 yards per attempt. Like that's productive running back. 10 yards per reception last year. Yeah. So he's, he's got the ability to put up the production, but no one's ever been Mm -hmm. able to unlock the who draft Twitter and who people think Duke Johnson can be. And maybe that happens in Buffalo, maybe not, but I think at least your floor that you're dealing with is better than they had a year ago. And that you have a guy that can at least provide you with the floor of the production they thought you were going to get with JD McKissick. So I think at the end of the day, it patches the hole in my heart. That was JD McKissick going back to the commanders. It patches it just fine. Yeah. It's a player going one going into their seventh year, one going into their eighth year. They're both very, very similar. I think it's the kind of environment that we'll be happy to. And I, and I think honestly, it it does not stop us from drafting a running back. I think that it maybe is a threat. If we draft a running back, Zach Moss might need to keep his eyes open uh, on on what's going on there. But um, I still very much would like a speed explosive back in the draft. And then I'd love to have them all, you know, duke it out and then have Singletary, Duke Johnson and the rookie go for where it's going. I I didn't mean that, but it it, it did come off that way. So I'll, I'll, I'll take credit for it. So another player that here, I think people have a different idea of how old he was is Jamison Crowder. Uh, it's a guy that I was really excited about. As soon as some of the market dwindled down and we released it, I kept saying that, hey, I don't think we can afford Jamison Crowder. That's right, yeah. But if we can, he's ideal. And we've done a lot of graphics since then. He is Cole Beasley. Like he's his production's identical. He's a little different player. Beasley is a little better at creating separation, Nuance. although Crowder is very good. Uh, Beasley was elite at creating separation. Sure. Crowder's a little better at yak and getting yards after the catch and has a little more elusiveness. And we have, Everybody remembers the 70-yarder that he broke all the tackles after 10 yards and then ran for the touchdown. Um, but their production is very, very similar in that they are – prototypical slot receivers that can get open. He's great with leverage in the zone. Uh, I think that he has an opportunity to do it. Um, And that one that uh, I tried to remind people of, he's a year and a half older than Isaiah McKenzie. They're going to play this year at 29 and 27, whereas your brain would tell you, oh, McKenzie is this new flashy guy who's just breaking out. And we've heard about uh, Crowder forever. He must be like 33. No, that right now they're 26 and 28. They're yeah. about to turn 27 and 29. Like the, It's just not as crazy as what you thought. I'm pretty I was sure we, about they it. got Beasley around the same point in his career, right? As Crowder yep. as well. Yeah, so it's a it really... Except we got Crowder for $4 million and not for a $28 million deal. Sure. And this, to me, again, is the Bills maintaining that floor, right? Like when I saw Beasley was going to get released, my immediate worry was the floor just dropped out of wide receiver three. I don't, I'm not a believer in Isaiah McKenzie as a slot wide receiver. I like him in the role of gadget guy. Sure. If Bill Belichick's going to run man on you for a whole game, give give him run. I'm all for it, but he's primarily a gadget guy. So you lose the floor there for me. And I was looking at ways. How do we replace that floor? Because I saw that spot track value on Jamison Crowder. And I was like, man, even at half that, like where the bills aren't in on that. So yeah. that was just something I wasn't even thinking of. I was thinking of, man, maybe you can get it. Jarvis Landry to take a real cheap discount for one run at a title. Maybe you can get one of these guys in here, but you're, you're not going to maintain the floor. Maybe of a Cole Beasley and then boom, Brandon Bean brings in Crowder. And I think you look at it, the production, at least bare minimum, I think you're going to see similar production yeah. and maybe you get a little bit more out of it. Crowder's never played with a quarterback like Josh Allen. He's yeah. never had the opportunity to get fed the ball, uh, play with another receiver like a Stefan Diggs who pulls oh. that type of gravity, you know, play with a Dawson Knox who's going to pull some things. This might open up a level from Crowder we haven't seen. That's what it did for Cole Beasley when he came yeah. from the Cowboys. He played at a different level for three years. If the Bills can replenish these wide receiver rooms in this way, sign me up. Yeah. Well, and the contract show that it's actually pretty similar to what they signed McKenzie for. So I know the initial news broke that McKenzie was up to $8 million on a two year deal. It's the same thing. Crowder is up to $4 million. Yeah. Crowder has a slightly higher um, cap hit, like a hundred thousand more. He got a little bit more of a signing bonus than what McKenzie got. So they spent a little bit more money on him, but both of them are basically coming in saying, Hey, 
one of you is going to get good production here. You both have two million plus in incentives that you can earn. In it, the incentives are catches, yards, and touchdowns. Sal reported that earlier this uh, earlier today that those are what the incentives are. So right. if he has good production, he makes that money back. But Happy if he doesn't, yeah. and if McKenzie takes the role, he earns more money. So yeah. Bean set it up perfectly to benefit the team. Whoever wins that job and gets the production gets the money and the, the other yeah god bless him that that's fantastic i i will wager that it's jameson crowder i think yeah. he's the guy who's going to get that production and is going to be josh's trusted safety blanket i don't i think if josh trusted isaiah mckenzie like that we would have seen it already sure. um but if he does and he's ready to step up into that role and not to just show limited capability against man coverage but he can do it against zone coverage which anybody who isn't aware the nfl plays about 70 percent zone coverage if McKenzie all of a sudden picks up the nuance of how to get open against zone coverage, God bless him. He'll make the $4 million and he gets the money. That's great. Yep. Uh, I got to respond. David Miller here, not calling you out, man, but uh, David Miller saying McKenzie would probably start nope. anywhere else. There's probably a handful of teams that he could crack the starting lineup, but I don't know that he goes to any one team day one. If he was that player, his agent would have gotten him a deal yeah. outside of Buffalo to play, to be a starter somewhere else. Yeah. Like you want to know the why loyalties here, not? but to be a starter in the NFL, if a team came to Isaiah McKenzie's agent and said, we want to pay you to be a starter and we're going to give you a starting role in our offense. No questions asked. I would be blown away if I'm Isaiah McKenzie took less to stay here. I don't think that's the world Absolutely that he not. operates in. So two years in a row, Isaiah McKenzie was a restricted free agent. They didn't even tender him. They tendered Ike Bakker, and they didn't even tender him. They let him be a res, uh, an unrestricted free agent. He went on visits to talk to other teams and came back for $1.75 million. He then had the season he had last year with the flashes against the Patriots in that game. He was an unrestricted free agent again and was able to call around to other teams. And he the said agents... it. He said it in one of his interviews with on One Bill's Live, said, I was on my phone with my agent every day. He was telling me what teams were saying. So, yeah. like, so he was speaking to other teams. And he came back for $1.85 The entire NFL is telling you he's a barely above the veteran minimum player. The entire NFL has had a chance to sign him two years in good. a row. That's still fine. And the Bills brought him back, and he's a little bit above a veteran minimum player. And that's what he signed at for two years in a row. And now if we get more value than that from him, awesome. That's great. Good job, Brandon Bean. But the the idea that this 27-year-old going into his sixth season is some hidden superstar, I just don't. It's I tough for me. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one for me to see. But I'm wishing him the best of luck. And if we need him in a pinch, I, I hope that he can yeah. play at a star, starting caliber level. But I'm glad Brandon Bean is in the line of thinking with us where that I didn't want to go into the season with McKenzie as the favorite to win that slot. To know that there's competition there and that the guys, sure. in my opinion, a step quite above McKenzie makes me feel good. And I think Brandon Bean probably echoed our sentiments uh, about Isaiah McKenzie in that move alone. Yeah, yes, correct. They wouldn't have gone out and signed Jamison Crowder. And obviously, you know, there there's no there's a little bit more investment in Crowder, but not a lot more. No. Um, they gave him I think 150,000 more in a signing bonus than what McKenzie got. That's not a huge difference. Um, so if McKenzie beats him out, God bless him. That's great. He'll yeah. get the production, he'll be able to do it. Um, but ultimately we got two guys that were available to the entire NFL and are going to come in and compete for this spot, which is a coveted spot to be that slot receiver in the Buffalo. For Josh Allen. Yeah. So those are all the moves that happened since last week. Obviously we know there hasn't been a um, additional signing at cornerback. We all want there to be a signing at cornerback just to alleviate that stress. We know that Rick Bates is still out there. Uh, Ryan uh, Talbot reported earlier today that he's done with visits and he's now weighing his options. Bates um, watch. I can tell you, if he received some monster front-loaded deal, he would have already signed it. And the right. report would have been Ryan Bates has signed with X team because they offered him some big front-loaded deal. Yeah, they locked him uh, up. So either he's weighing, you know, hey, this team offered me two years and eight million, but they front-loaded six million of it in the first year, so the bills can't match it, but it's still only eight million over two years. His agent may be evaluating that signing the tender and going into full unrestricted free agency next year might be worth more money. He might get more money that way. So we're going to find out soon, but I, I think all options are still on the table. I think he could um, sign the tender and come back for one year with Buffalo. 
I think he could just straight up agree to an extension with Buffalo, or I think he could sign an agreement with another team and give Buffalo the chance to match to be able to go that route. I think all of those are on the table still. Yeah, I think everything's on the table. I think his agent's done actually a really good job by yeah. him uh, here in this process. You you go, you meet these teams, you find your value, whether it's for this negotiation stage with Brandon Bean and saying, hey, you know, when we get an offer, like there's legitimate interest out here in my client. And if he comes back to the bills, like you said, if he just signs that tender and comes back and plays for one year, then he's already established himself as a free agent that's been wanted by other teams, that there's interest sniffing around him with other teams, whether or not this season goes as successfully as last. So his agent's done a good job propping up that interest, whether or not he takes it. I'm hoping ultimately that it ends in extension. I don't want to, the, the floor I'm okay with, right? You get Roger Saffold in this offensive line. And then, you know, you have Rick Bates who played at a good level and you want to see that continue. I don't want that floor to drop off to Cody Ford. Right, like going into this draft yeah, process sure. because we're right now we're trying to avoid those needs. Right, I did a conversation earlier about man, if Bradbury can shake loose and we can get that so out of the way, so we don't have to draft something. I don't want to have to in those top three rounds really be looking at guard and have to feel like we walk have to walk away with an interior offensive lineman to maintain that floor. I just want to get Rick Bates back. Yes. And I will say there are options. You know, uh, Will Hernandez is out there. Uh, he has some experience with. Them. I liked him in the draft. You could bring back Daryl Williams. That's sure. not crazy. You know, like he he's still has paying that anybody yet. dead cap hit. Yeah, but plus you know, whatever. You, you know, it, that's already been paid and that's already part of the cap. So it's not mm-hmm. like, yes, it's not ideal. You would have preferred to simply agree to a pay cut and have him stay and not pay that dead cap. But also, my guy, uh, Tardif, Lauren, Lauren, Tardif, yeah, there you go. Still available. There you go. A little rotation. You know, there's guard. options that are not out the there. floor that I think plus a draft could pick. be, but yeah, yeah, plus a draft pick we would need uh, to to do there. But ideally, we keep uh, Ryan Bates. You know, he stays as Rick. If he leaves, he's back to Ryan Bates. If he stays, he's Rick Bates. Stays Rick. Um, you know, hopefully we keep Rick and we're able to yeah. carry that on. I don't. Ex- I expect more signings to happen, but I expect them to be veteran minimum depth signings until uh, Bradbury the, shakes loose. Correct. The right. one that would come up with honestly would be if Bradbury gets released. That sure. would be the one that you would convert some of those uh, restructures to create some space to go get a player like that. Um, and honestly, there's a little piece of me that wonders if Brandon Bean already knows that answer. Like you know, obviously they've already talked to his agent for other reasons. Um, if he gets released, they might already have something sketched out to be like, hey, we'll we'll give it to you, but we're not going to trade for him. You got to be able to be free to sign it. Yeah, that's going to be a game of chicken with the yeah. uh, the Giants and seeing how much they want to get away from that. Um, that that's going to be a tough one to see because he is still a good football player, right? I think like Joe Shane is probably still in that Sean McDermott, uh, Brandon Bean era where you're you are clearing things out from a previous regime but you're trying to compete right like i think joe shane and uh, brian dable want to have a competitive team this year and say, get people to buy into that culture Bradbury's still a good player like it, what do at what point do you lose the game of chicken and just cut ties with this guy uh because you're not going to replace that talent correct correct it, it does it does give a challenge so um as you guys get ready we're now going to shift gears from free agency into draft i have held my mock draft uh virginity this entire time i don't believe you've been doing them you just haven't posted them i have not done a single mock draft on any website all year not one i swear on my honor i have not done a single mock draft on any website i'm gonna do my first one tomorrow and it's going to be my first one. I have been doing some draft work. I have been reading, getting myself caught up. I have been reading draft guides. I've read lots of other people's mock drafts. Right. Um, I watched the combine. I've started. To, I've done my work to get ready. But I am doing my first mock draft tomorrow. We are going to start switching into uh, draft mode on the show here. We have five shows leading up to the draft starting next week. Uh, we might be doing something special on site somewhere. We'll have to see when that happens. Uh, we'll be bringing on lots of awesome guests who know a mm. ton about the draft to help us go through their version of mock drafts for the Bills and who they uh, think is going to be a good fit for, for our squad. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Aaron, what are you most excited about in this next phase? Yeah, so I started a little earlier and then you know, I'm officially maybe eight mocks in i'm keeping a running track of how my mocks are going on a, on a spreadsheet so i can share it with you where i'm at so far but what i will say about this process is um when we're talking about mocks and we get get forward to this draft process a couple of things i want to just lay out there for folks these mocks are thought 
exercise. This is not, if I'm posting one, it's not a prediction. It's me running through a simulation with a big board that I was given. I don't have any say in who's available, where, how this Or is it out. realistic of what will happen under Nor is it realistic how it's going to happen. But for me, what it is, is a way to familiarize myself with who potentially could be available when the bills are. If I was to pass on cornerback in those first two rounds what's that look like for me down the road so a lot of times when we're working through these things it's just these thought exercises of hey how can this draft play out for us who maybe is going to be in this range of players and familiarizing ourselves with guys i don't watch a ton of college football so it's this process so for me right now greg i've been in a handful of weeks maybe ahead of you right now and i'm still once i get into that sixth round those picks in the sixth and seventh round like I'm throwing darts at a wall. Like I'm, I'm learning some of those names, but I'm hanging out around the fourth, fifth round right now of comfort level. I'm, I'm not quite a full mock draft of comfort level in there, but I'm excited with the guests that we've got lined up to help us get over that hump and, and get you all the good draft content you need. Awesome. Can't wait for it. You guys are going to love the guests we have coming in. You're going to love everything we have set up. Um, it's going to be fantastic. And, and it's going to be a lot of fun to be able to, to go back and forth. So uh, make sure you're checking it out. The The chat's been awesome tonight. We thank you guys so, so much. Uh, make sure you're checking out all the other shows on the network. So many good things going on all across the network. Every single night of the week, we got everything that you guys need. Uh, but on behalf of Aaron Quinn, I'm Greg Thompson. You've been listening to Cover One Buffalo, and we are out.